Today, October 9th, the voice of labor was heard once more. Union members are gathering in Gary, Indiana at Roosevelt High School to join in a rally named Solidarity Day 2. Bill Andrews, president of Local 1010, and the union's committee on political education have worked hard organizing this rally. What is the purpose of this rally slated as Solidarity Day 2? Uh, the purpose of the rally is to continue what we started on September the 19th in Washington, D.C. And uh, what we're trying to do is involve the persons or the people that were left behind in the community that were not able to attend the Washington rally to get something going in the community itself as a follow-up. It appears that Local 1010 is the first union to schedule a follow-up to Solidarity Day. Several dignitaries will be on hand to listen to the concerns of union members. Andrews discussed some of the hopes he has for the rally. Well, what we are really shooting at is, is to impress upon the legislators and the, uh, the elected officials that be that the persons in the community and the labor movement and the churches and everybody are concerned about what uh, position the Reagan administration has and the fact that uh, we're not happy with it and uh, that we want them to help us to turn Ronald Reagan's programs around. Reagan recently accused union leaders of being out of touch with the rank and file. Andrews disagrees. I think it's just the opposite. I think that Ronald Reagan is out of contingent uh, with the persons in the United States of America. There's always a, a somebody saying that union leaders become uh, so high, so to speak, that they forget where they come from. I tend to think that uh, there might be isolated cases like that. But on the mo most part, our union leaders are in contingent with us, and uh, they're the ones that call the march on Washington. And if they were that far out of touch, then we wouldn't have had that march. You can never give up. You win elections, you do lose elections, it doesn't matter. You still come back with the same philosophy of good government is good politics and serving the people. And that's what Jack Crawford has done as a prosecutor of Lake County. He has served all the people. I'm glad to be here this evening. Thank you very much. Crawford has not yet announced his re-election. He says if he does decide to run, he'll make some changes in his platform from the previous election. We've, we're still in the middle of a very vast crime wave right here in Lake County, Indiana. There's no question about that. And we've got to do something to curtail that. And I'm not satisfied with these statistics that we received so far. Mm -hmm. Our programs are new. Perhaps they haven't had time to take effect, but we still have a serious crime problem. Until we try and reduce that, I will feel like my job hasn't been fulfilled. Members of the Indiana Citizens Action Coalition will join in a rally tonight in the City Council Chambers in Gary. Gary City Attorney Art Darinazzi explains. The purpose of the rally is primarily to acquaint the uh, public with the recent developments uh, with respect to NIPSCO's uh, request for a rate increase and also to get the response of people to the uh, the uh, Public Service Commission's action in, uh, in hiking the residential rates way beyond the hike for uh, industrial users. Okay, well, the CAC is disappointed in the new Public Service Commission's ruling on structuring rates according to the cost of service. Now, this concept of determining rates on the basis of cost of service as over against the statutory uh, scale, uh, standard, which is just and reasonable, is a marked change. And what the effect of that has been that NIPSCO came up with a rate structure in order to collect that $44 million, which now 
uh, meant that the residential users would be charged 13.55 percent, the and the largest industrial users would end up with a 0.64 percent, which was, in our judgment, uh, almost an obscene sort of development. Mm. And While many Americans are still asking just what was Vietnam, a war, a police action, or what, they are forgetting the men who fought and died for the country they believed in. That's the idea of the Porter Lake County Leadership Council, who are sponsoring a runathon on November 7th. Tom Hopkins, director of the LPLC, announced the runathon with these statements. If you can call it a war, if we didn't win it because we chose not to, if we didn't win it because it was uh, unwinnable is really academic. The really important thing is that those veterans that fought in that war were motivated out of the same spirit that the veterans that fought in any other war were. And this patriotism has got to be aroused again. And we also, as a special reminder, Dr. Robert Angerman, who designed the famous T-shirt worn by the hostages in Iran, has designed a shirt honoring the Vietnam veterans that will be sold the day of the run. Registration for the Runathon, a salute to veterans, will be conducted at the Wicker Park Pavilion in Highland, Indiana. Entry fee is $5 in advance or $6 the day of the run. Pre-registration may be made by writing the LPLC at Box 981, Chesterton. Salute to veterans on November 7th. For Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Haviland. Yes, there are some needs and we're working toward that end. <coughs> We're in the process of transferring some funds <coughs> to take care of some of our repairs. <coughs> I might say that you had to realize that the um, the repairs now uh, there's a tremendous amount of money needed for repairs. I mean, even in automobiles, it's quite a bit of money needed for repairs. And uh, we have some older equipment, and it's working. It's not working like I could, like I would like to see it working, but it's working. It's workable. And we're in the process, I've met with Mr. Holland and talked with him about getting some needed money for repairs and we're in the process of doing that now. Men have shied away from the field of nursing because of stereotyped images. But the head of Purdue University's School of Nursing says the old perceptions are slowly changing. Men have been socialized not to interact with people at a very personal level. They see this as a female trait, but the, the attitudes that, that came up during the 60s and the 70s where it turned out that it was okay to admit whatever feelings you had has dispelled some of this, these stereotypes. And I think the men now who do have a, 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 a desire to interact and to help people are taking another look at nursing. In the future, Getty's fields, more men may be drawn to nursing because there are plenty of job opportunities as a result of nursing shortages. Employers do not discriminate 
on the basis of sex when it comes to hiring a good, able, professional nurse. So yes, I would like to see more men come into nursing. They'll certainly help help the patient care situation and they'll help alleviate the nursing shortage. As competition in other fields increase, many more men may realize they can find a rewarding career in nursing, although currently only 5% of the nurses are men. For Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Haviland. substituted pink posies for this poor man's yellow posies. Which... Back in medieval times, a hospice was a shelter for weary travelers. Today, that concept has changed. Pat Bowensteiner, social director from the Visiting Nurse Association in Valparaiso, explains. Hospice means um, uh, it's not a building or a place specifically, although it can be, but it's more of a concept of care for the terminally ill patient. Uh, it can be, as I said, a, a specific building that is a hospice where this care can be given. It can also be done in the hospital in a special area that they've designated for this type of care, or it can be given in the home um, by a special team approach which differs from the hospital mm -hmm. approach. The VNA believes that a hospice can provide care and support for the patient and family that might not be available at the hospital. Ione Wheeler explains. Uh, many of these patients are uh, in a terminal stage for several months and they do not wish to be in a hospital where they are confined to a certain area and where the family is only able to come at a certain time. I mean, we see hospice as a place this, that the patient can stay at home and be relatively free of pain and continue their life as well as they can. The VNA sees a need for hospice in the Porter County area. They'll be holding a meeting this coming Monday, 7.30 at Labine Hall on the campus of Valparaiso University. Following a film on hospice care, there'll be a panel discussion with an area physician, RN, and workers from the VNA concerning the possibility of establishing a hospice in Porter County. Some of the, these music is real, real good, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. For an example. Well, some of the tunes that even that the Beatles made a few years ago, or some other uh, recording stars and song entertainers, I think that they're, beautiful, they're doing a beautiful job. Except myself, of course, I'm for the big bands. And I like the big band arrangement, but I, I'm not uh, against, you know, uh, rock or anything like that. But I like to play it in a big band sound, mm -hmm. and I hope that the people today will, you know, like our style. Do you think the big band will ever come back like it was in the 30s and 40s? I think they're coming back right now. It's just, for example, some of the ballrooms right now, like Willowbrook Ballroom, they're uh, bringing in bands right now that uh, some of their leaders have been probably that for many years and they're, the band is a uh, ghost band is still you know they're playing there Glenn Miller's band is uh, gonna be there there's Les Brown 
There's Count Basie's in Chicago, Harry James and so on, with more. You know, that shows one thing, the big bands are coming back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope I'm one of them. As a top saxophone and reed player, Red performed during the 1940s as a sideman with such well-known bands as Sammy Kay, Eddie Howard, and Sherman Hay, whose band used to perform regularly at the Chicago Blackhawk restaurant. Economic cutbacks have been cutting into the services available to school children throughout the area for the past several months. Last night, possible deregulation and violations of Public Law 94-142 came under fire at the Hammond School Board room. Public Law 94-142 deals with the requirement for school to offer educationally sound programs to students who have various physical or learning disabilities. Economically, it would be to a school system's advantage to back deregulation, but parents are not accepting economy versus education. Deeper than that, parents have been made aware recently many of the teachers in the special education classrooms in Hammond are not licensed to teach certain types of special children. Their credentials of the various teachers may allow them to teach special education, but not specific disabilities. Rowena Paiti director of the special education system for the Hammond schools admitted there are teachers teaching in non-certified areas but the alternative is to shuttle students to other sites where there are certified teachers. She did say reports to the state did not always reflect the actual situation at the school but what the state required. The question is much deeper than just who should teach what. The question is will public education continue to serve the best interest of the students involved or the pocketbook. These concerned parents in Hammond indicate they want education of all school children to be the primary concern. For Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Haviland. I am very grateful for the program. It's opened up many, many doors. Uh, since that time, I've had the opportunity to even accept a uh, direct commission. And uh, it's helped me do my job better to serve the people here in the state. And for that, I am very grateful. At the time when unemployment and crime rates are increasing in astronomical proportions, uh, we're asking that we be given the funds to help fill our educational institutions. I highly urge that, and I'm sure you will, the committee will give recommendations to the uh, legislature that they make it a top priority item as well as gifted and talented uh, regular education programs and special education. I spoke to Representative Steve Collins concerning his stand on adult education. And my own view is that we come up with an innovative way of funding it that we have a good chance of increasing the level of funding to adult ed and what we are proposing is a cigarette tax increase that would be dedicated to adult ed. Now, I think the committee should responsibly come up with a funding proposal. Yes, we've issued a reward um, for information leading to the arrest and conviction of who might be responsible for the fires that we had uh, in the lakeshore that destroyed uh, five government-owned structures. 
uh, anyone that has information that might lead to the arrest and conviction should call a special emergency number here, which is in area code 219-926-5900. As of this time, police have no leads to any possible suspects. Anything I would say at this point would be conjecture. The FBI was called in by us. They have taken the lead in the investigation. We're assisting them. Uh, and at this point, um, there have been a lot of theories, you know, floating around. Um, but uh, I'm unaware of any definite leads or, mm -hmm. you know, positive theories. During the month of October, state and local police will be conducting car safety checks. Since the repeal of the motor vehicle inspection law, more and more junk cars can be found on the roads. Sergeant Larry Dembinski from the Indiana State Police explains the details of the safety check. The uh, inspection that the officers conduct is uh, probably takes one to two minutes. It's a very simple check and they're looking for uh, uh, those defects that are the most common. Uh, for instance, windshield wipers not working, uh, the horn not working, headlights out tail lights, uh, turn signals, brake lights, leaky exhaust system, and just a quick check to make sure there aren't any bald tires on the car. The inspection is relatively easy. A police officer will flag you over to the side of the road, conduct the inspection, and if there are no violations, you're free to go on your way. In most cases, if a minor violation is found, a warning will be issued. Most of the arrests are in the license and registration phase of it. Uh, just recently, we've had uh, uh, well, the one at St. John, I think, in that period they inspected 150 cars and 22 warnings were issued for defective vehicles. Four arrests were made, two of which were suspended driver's licenses. And in one recent inspection, we had uh, two people pulled in, and one driver's license has been expired since 1974 and the other since 1976. So uh, those are the types of violations that you wouldn't normally come across on routine patrol. Any day now, we could have weather that looks something like this. Now's the time to prepare your car for the hard winter ahead. One of the first things you need to do is pull out your snow tires. Steaded snow tires are legal in Indiana between October 1st and May 1st. Now, studded snow tires won't help you in the snow, but they will help you on ice. Many people panic when they begin to slip and slide on ice. Sergeant Larry Dembinski from the Indiana State Police explains what to do when this happens. First of all, be looking down the road ahead. If you get into a situation where your car is starting to skid, uh, do not just slam on the brakes because once you have done that, you have lost all control of the vehicle. Uh, as your vehicle is starting to skid, if, you're, if the back end is starting to go around to the right, you turn your wheel in the direction of the skid. In other words, and don't yank it. In other words, just turn toward it and just pump the brakes very gently. Uh, matter of fact, it would be better not to pump them at all if there isn't a need to try to slow down a little bit. Uh, but uh, the more common reaction is uh, take your foot off the accelerator, turn in the direction of the skid, and uh, try to bring it to a you know, slow down as quickly as possible without slamming in the brakes. Mm -hmm. What began as a routine inquiry of a house fire at 445 Marshall has now developed into an in-depth examination. The day that Channel 50 went out to take some footage of the damaged home, we interviewed Moselle Heyman, an eyewitness to the fire, who told us what condition the first fire truck was in. And so I don't want to say it's their response time. It was the inability to service the call once they got here. You know, no equipment, you know, no hoses on that first truck. We talked to other residents on Marshall Street who were concerned about this issue. But I was there when um, they were breaking the windows and things, trying to get all the, you know, the stuff out. But um, what I was interested in, you know, trying to get the neighbors together, because we found out that we didn't have ample supply of fire equipment. 
-hmm. If they had a, maybe that child would have been saved. Hugh Blackwell, president of the Firemen's Union, showed us firsthand what shape the equipment is in. This is fire truck number eight, the one that answered the fire at 445 Marshall. A generator is supposed to be on the truck. The generator broke down a while ago and it has not been replaced. This hose is supposed to have a nozzle on it. It doesn't because there's no need for a nozzle when the truck doesn't carry water. The booster water pump on this truck is broken. The truck in this garage is under repair. In fact, it's been under repair for seven months. The transmission is broken. This engine has a broken axle. The axle's been broken for four months. And this is station 12. Station 12 is empty. The engine that is supposed to go in this station is in another station filling in for an engine that is not working. This is a residential area between two schools a housing project, and an apartment complex. What shape is the equipment, the fire protection equipment, in in the city of Gary? Uh, we're in uh, very bad shape now. Um, we have uh, two out of five truck companies that are out of service, and we have uh, at any one time from three to four engine companies that are out of service. Um, the manpower is low. Uh, we're running a, at approximately 260 some personnel. Uh, it's approximately 30 of those personnel in dispatching, fire prevention, uh, in the front office, in the chief's office, and what have you. And uh, that leaves approximately 200 men to uh, man the fire rigs. Blackwell was even more specific with his assessment. So with engine companies out of the service, technically the city of Gary is uh, about, I would say, from half to three quarters unprotected at any one time. All of this has a serious effect on the individual firefighter who is asked to respond to an alarm with equipment that is not in proper working order. What are the men saying? What are the firefighters saying? They're, they're very disgusted. Uh, it kind of hurts when you have to go to an alarm and you realize people are going to lose property and it's going to be an expensive proposition for them to replace that property. Uh, Insurance companies usually take depreciation, so consequently we try to do our best to save as much as we can. And with the basically with the type of equipment that we have, it's hard for us to do that. So, well, would you say morale is low? Is it's it? very low. It's very low. Morale is very bad. Blackwell had a message for the citizens of Gary from the firefighters. Uh, well, I'd like to say this to the citizens of Gary, and I, I and I hate to to seem dry when I say this, but this is really the way I feel. We have, we have tried uh, the best with the limited amount of uh, uh, equipment, uh, with the limited amount of men that we have had. Uh, we've tried our best to serve the citizens well. And uh, all that we're asking is the citizens that, to, to come out and take a look at these stations and find out that we're just not crying in the dark, that uh, we're serious about it. And it bothers us 
when we can't adequately do our job because of uh, the lack of equipment or lack of men and what have you. And that uh, it's, it's about time for them to carry their complaints down to 4th and Broadway where something can be done about it. As we've learned from the last two nights, there seems to be a serious problem with the fire protection equipment in the city of Gary. This is part three of our investigation. Our central question still remains, does the Gary Fire Department provide quality fire protection for the citizens of Gary? To help us answer that question, we talked to Councilman Clemens Allen, Chairman of the Public Safety Committee and Overseer of the Fire and Police Departments. What could you generally say about the condition of the equipment of the fire department for the city of Gary? Well, based upon uh, my observation and certain areas of the fire department within the city that I have uh, explored and investigated, uh, it is my conclusion at this point that most of the equipment is in a state of uh, disrepair. Um, it seems that uh, a lot of the equipment is really unable at this point to uh, function in the manner that it was originally constructed uh, to do. Allen went out to the fire garage to get a first-hand look at the situation. I have uh, visibly and physically inspected uh, much of the equipment that is located at the fire garage here in Gary. Um, my last such visit was about three weeks ago, and there was, uh, on my count, about nine pieces of fire equipment just sitting in the garage, much of which was just rotting away. Being an ex-fireman himself, Alan is concerned about the possibility of a major crisis in Gary. But if, in fact, we were to have six or seven fires in this community at one time, I would just have to say a prayer because at this point, I don't honestly believe that we would be able to handle the situation. In his own words, Alan said the situation spells disaster. We asked him how all of this could have happened. I think uh, the answer is very simply, uh, very, very simple. Uh, uh, there has been, in my opinion, uh, a mix-up uh, in priorities. Uh, I've always uh, considered that public safety ought to be the number one priority in a community. That has not been the main consideration as expressed by the present administration. The major problem seems to be a lack of money. Last year's budget and this year's budget are seriously deficient in proper funding for repairs. And last year, a budget was approved that provided for $1,000 in the equipment account for the fire department. Well, you wouldn't really have to have a large degree of expertise to understand the fact that $1,000 is not enough money to suffice mm -hmm. for uh, a fire department of any size. As a matter of fact, you couldn't purchase two nozzles for a fire hose with $1,000. In the year coming up, 1982, the city council just approved a budget that would provide for no money in the equipment account for the fire department and a very, very minimal amount of money in the repairs and maintenance account, which means that we began each year behind. And as a result, at the conclusion of each year, we are further and further and further behind. Allen talked about the possibility of selling bonds to get the money for the needed repairs. But at the time we interviewed him, he did not see a solution in the near future. This is Nadine Messina reporting for Channel 50 News.
coach operators, as you might imagine, will be bringing tour groups throughout Indiana from time to time, and this effort will give them the opportunity to identify the kinds of uh, activities that they can bring people in the future to Gary to see. Also discussed at Mayor Hatcher's press conference was the issue of reapportionment. Gary will participate in a suit against the reapportionment problem in Indiana. Uh, that a number of, uh, of Democrats uh, around the state of Indiana will join together to go into court uh, to attempt to uh, uh, bring some fairness and some uh, justice uh, to of what is currently an extremely unfair and unjust uh, situation. The book is simply entitled Bowen, and it's all about Governor Otis R. Bowen and his experiences in the state's highest office. Bowen and the book's author, William J. Watt, were promoting the biography at Ellis Ayers in South Lake Mall this morning. Watt, who was executive assistant to the governor during Bowen's administration, said he wrote the book because Bowen was such a successful and popular governor. Uh, that makes him pretty unique, and uh, I think a lot of people are curious as to how that all came about and, and what happened. And it uh, seemed to me that while it was still fresh in my mind that uh, there might be some value in uh, doing a project of this type. Both Watt and Bowen felt the high point of the former governor's career was the adoption of his tax relief program. Bowen felt this biography highlighted both the good and bad points of his term as governor. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. Watt did a splendid job of uh, uh, portraying uh, the administration. Uh, one might think that because he was uh, an insider, so to speak, that uh, he might have uh, flavored it a little uh, too uh, much in my direction, but uh, he also brought in uh, some of the uh, failures, which I think that uh, makes it a, a more authentic uh, book. At the South Lake Mall in Maryville this weekend is an exhibit for and about disabled persons. This exhibit has been sponsored by the Ileana Coordinating Council on the Handicap, the Calumet Region Chapter of the National Spinal Cord Injury Association, and the Lake County Advocates Serving the Handicap, or LASH. The exhibit, entitled Everybody Counts, is designed to show what handicapped people are capable of doing with the help of certain aids. Linda Cash, one of the organizers, talked about the importance of the exhibit. So to let the general public just wa walk through them all, see that uh, the different things handicapped people can do, do do, and uh, they, uh, we just thought it would be, you know, help both the general public and, and handicapped persons. The exhibit contains several prosthetic devices to help the handicap. This is a new bionic arm for children, a car equipped with an automatic lift, a motorized wheelchair called an Amago, and even a revolving shelf to help make home items accessible to the handicapped person. Everybody Counts has approximately 60 exhibits and lots of people touring and learning. One such browser, Alina, talked to us about her plans for the future. Well, let me ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up, since everybody kind of wonders at 10 years old what they want to be? I don't know. I keep saying I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a nurse, I don't know where I'm going to be. You haven't made up your mind no. yet. Okay, well, I'll, I'll know when I'm 19. Well, that might be a good time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is Nadine Messina reporting for Channel 50 News. In recent weeks, we've heard some negative comments about unions. Today, we found two picketers outside the J&M grocery store at 4504 Holman informing the public that the store is non-unionized. Zeke Russ, Meat Cutters Union 546, outlined the benefits of having a union. Everybody makes better wages and better working conditions, and uh, 
at least one thing about a union store is that a person can't just be fired for anything, or just because they don't like the, the way they, the boss don't like the way he combs his hair. Uh, this man can fire him, and they have no recourse. Ann Barron of Local 1460 alleged that some of the employees had been fired for disagreeing with management. He has, uh, it is our understanding that he has threatened the people that if they did want to become to the union uh, or unionized and organized, then they would be immediately terminated. To my knowledge, I don't have, and I did not fire anybody. I had people that did quit, and you have any jobs that people come and go. Store owner John Lockus disagreed and contends that a small family business such as his does not need a union. This is Nadine Messina reporting for Channel 50 News. Around 8.30 this morning, Gary Fire officials say they received a call that an explosion occurred at the Anderson Development Company. Witnesses at the scene say a second blast followed within seconds of the first. As of this time, officials say they have no idea what caused the first two explosions. About 45 minutes later, a third explosion occurred. Five firefighters were injured, including Gary Fire Chief William Cherry. Gary Police Sergeant Roy Robertson explains. Uh, we had several firemen that went down in the second explosion. Uh, I was about 25, 30 feet from it, and uh, they were literally knocked off their feet. The uh, secondary explosion came uh, shortly after some of the, I guess, the 150-gallon drum started igniting and uh, popping out there from the heat. 50-year-old Chief William Cherry is listed in stable condition with a head injury at Methodist Hospital. 28-year-old firefighter Bruce Hollingsworth is in stable condition with a back injury. Two other firefighters, 23-year-old Daryl Smith and 37-year-old Percy Moten, were treated for minor injuries. There seems to be certain discrepancies between what Anderson has told the firefighters and what the firefighters have found. The third explosion involved magnesium. Assistant Fire Chief Ben Perry says the Anderson Development Company did not notify them of the magnesium content. On our arrival, the plant manager never informed us that there was magnesium. The only time we found out magnesium was when we got the white sparks, and you noticed it turned into a track meet then, and then there was the explosion. Now the location as to what the plant manager related to is where the explosion occurred, they don't jive. So this is the reason that we're playing a waiting game. Do you have any idea why they're doing this to you? Why don't they tell you just the exact location to make things easier for you? True. It would make it a whole lot easier for us if the explosion and the location that they gave us would jive. Now, it could be 400 pounds up front and 400 pounds in the middle. Perry says the third explosion could have been averted if the company would have told them the exact contents and the location of the chemicals. Motorists on Indiana highways this weekend would be well advised to roll double nickels and keep the drinks at home as the weekend has been proclaimed a fatal free weekend. 
The massive effort involving the state police and all local and area police departments has had some assistance from groups like the Hammond Moose Lodge 520 in promoting the idea. Sergeant Larry Dembinski explains the concept of a fatal free weekend. Okay, the uh, fatality free weekend, the 7th and 8th, and the governor has procla proclaimed it to be a fatality free weekend, came about uh, from a project we had last year. We, we went for a fatality free day. We picked the Sunday before Thanksgiving last year where over a period of years we've had 10 or more killed in that one day. And we just went after it with days off canceled and the PR and telling the people we're going to be out there and we're looking for the drunk driver, uh, the speeders, the tailgaters, those violations that uh, over a period of years are causing the accidents. And uh, we ended up that 24 hour period with just one fatal. The secretary of the Hammond Moose Lodge explains what their involvement means. Well, the Moose first became involved at the Indiana State Convention in Indianapolis. A representative of the state police gave a talk and urged all of the secretaries and governors of the Moose Lodges to go back and explain to all their folks and see if they could become involved throughout the state. Even one human life is too much to waste on a mistake in a traffic accident. And this weekend, the Indiana State Police and all local police authorities will be trying to make that point known throughout Indiana. Drive safely this weekend. For Channel 50 News from Hammond, Indiana, I'm Rex Haviland. The political forum has opened again, and Floyd County Prosecutor Stephen Beardsley is the first Democrat to throw his hat into the ring for his party's nomination as U.S. Senator. The 35-year-old from New Albany said his campaign would not be against any one person, but against the Republican economic package in general. But he did have some comments about the current Republican Senator, Richard Lugar. And Mr. Lugar is a chief architect of this economic program. Indeed, uh, he has boasted that no senator in this country has supported the president's program as fully as he. And he has said yes to every proposal that's come down the pike, regardless of how short-sighted, regardless of how imprudent, regardless of upon its impact on this state. Beardsley said the money used by the government has been shifted from the truly needy to the truly greedy. As for other issues... How do you feel about uh, tax tuition credit? I think those are wrong, sir. Uh, the public school system in this state, it's the crowning jewel of our education system, and the last thing it needs is more money and vitality being sopped away from it by way of tax credits that make it easier to take people out of our public school system. I think those are wrong. The government ought not to be encouraging private education. It ought to stick to its first business, which is public education. 
Beardsley will travel to the southern part of the state tomorrow to continue to announce his candidacy as he seeks the Democratic nomination for U.S. Senator. For Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Haviland. Today in Gary, Representative Carolyn Mosby held a conference concerning energy conservation and how public awareness can make a difference in the cost and management of energy companies. We spoke with State Representative Hurley Goodall, who delivered the noontime keynote address called Energy and the New Federalism. Well, energy and new federalism, you know, new federalism is really not new. It's something that you know, was here when the 13 colonies first started. and. Uh, in essence, to me, it means that, you know, everyone goes for themselves, and I don't think we can survive that way. What good does it do to have the public speak out when the Public Service Commission grants the increase anyway? Well, that's a good question. The Public Service Commission is probably one of the problems, and no one, you know, has found a way to deal with that particular problem that we have with them. But I do think that, you know, public opinion is the only thing that can really change things, and I'm a firm believer that if enough people are informed about issues, changes can come to pass. Energy conservation, a problem we all have to deal with, and the rising cost of energy is an actuality we have to face. With certain conservation measures and certain public support, maybe we can control both of those entities. From Gary, Indiana, for Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Haviland. This has been an ongoing investigation for several weeks, and it has been, as I said, has been a cooperative and a uh, investigation that has been handled by both departments. Uh, I can only speak for what has happened as far as I know in our department. I, I know that there has been uh, many, many hours of investigation, a lot of overtime put in by the officers involved. Statistics show you that within the last probably couple of years, burglaries of a lot of different crimes is one of the ones that has really had a dramatic increase. Whether or not it's related to drugs or whatever, we could, probably some of it is. But there has been a tremendous increase in home burglaries. So consequently, we have put a tremendous emphasis on that particular problem. Uh, and there was a dramatic increase like in the South County areas where this situation arose. As more and more people grow older, and as a proportion of the population over 65 becomes greater, the need for retirement homes also increase. In 1983, Crown Point will respond to that need by building a new retirement village. The St. Anthony Medical Center in Crown Point will be the neighbor of the Franciscan Towers, a new retirement village. The Board of Directors of the Assisi Charitable Foundation announced approval for construction of the village, and today, Lawrence T. Filosa, chairman of the board, discussed reasons behind the project. Uh, the Assisi Foundation feel they have a commitment to life, and in fulfilling that commitment to life, we feel a retirement village is necessary in this area and through the work of our consultants and based on figures that are statistical factual, statistically factual, 
we know that a retirement village is needed in this area to serve the people. The village will have 200 units, and you will have to be at least 60 years old to live there. There will be a health club, an educational center, a restaurant, and 24-hour security. The emphasis will be on health care. Try and concentrate on the health and wellness program and the facilities that are needed there. And that simultaneously, uh, simultaneously we would try and then complete the educational facilities because one, they uh, need each other. The project should be completed sometime in 1987 and may prove to be the ultimate in luxurious retirement living. This is Nadine Messina reporting for Channel 50 News. This is an ongoing investigation being conducted by the Lake County Sheriff's Police, assisted by the Drug Enforcement Administration. Further indictments are anticipated. To maintain the integrity of the investigation and for further prosecution, no further information is available at this time.